the Joe Rogan experience. Can you describe what's going on with these mRNA viruses and how they differ, excuse me, mRNA vaccines and how they differ from uh, a regular vaccine and what, what's coming down the pipe from Pfizer? These are mRNA vaccines. It's yes. different in that it doesn't actually contain the virus, but it boosts your body's ability to fight off the virus. Yeah, so, um, so there are many different ways of developing vaccines. Uh, and the idea, the general idea behind a vaccine is, is that we want to give you kind of an ersatz infection. We want to expose you, make it as if you had been infected, but without the risk of getting the disease to trick your immune system into mounting an immune response so that your body is then prepared if it gets the real infection to fight it off. And uh, one of the simplest uh, ways you can think about it is so-called live attenuated virus. This is an old technology where you you take the virus to the laboratory, you culture it hundreds of times and hope for mutations that weaken the virus's ability to make you sick, but nevertheless keep the virus able to elicit an immune response. And then we give you that strain as a shot and you have, let's say, a mild illness, you, you develop antibodies and immunity and it's sustained. Or you can have inactivated virus, like one of the Chinese, the, so the Sinovac vaccine that's inactivated, was one of the first to start, uh, which was out of China, is a, is a live attenuated virus. So that is, uh, oh, I'm sorry, did I say live attenuated already? I can't remember. But anyway, the Sinovac vaccine is a virus in which they, they take the virus. I'm sorry, no, it's not like the previous example. In this case, we take the virus and we treat it, let's say, with heat or with chemicals to kill the virus, but still have it be immunogenic. And um, that's another approach. And there are many other approaches a dozen or so, or nine or 10 different approaches, one of which is this mRNA idea. And here, what is done is, um, so so I'm sorry, before I tell you about that, another approach might be to take, take uh, the RNA from the coronavirus that codes for a very important protein, the spike protein on the surface of the coronavirus, and insert that into a a really benign virus, let's say like a cold virus, for example. So we take this other species of virus, we genetically engineer it so that we insert some uh, material, some RNA into it, let's say, that forces that virus when it infects your cells to give you a common cold, but also to express this protein as if you had been infected with COVID or coronavirus. And then you mount an immune system to that immune response to that protein, and now you're immune. So we gave you like a mild illness and we protected you from a more serious one. The mRNA viruses are uh, vaccines are sort of like that. We inject you literally with 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 RNA, and the idea is is that your cells take up the RNA and start making the protein, the alien protein uh, that your uh, body uh, would have made. Like if if we had infected you with a real coronavirus, the real coronavirus, as many people remember from high school biology, the virus can't reproduce on its own. It inserts its genetic material into our cells which then start producing the viral, uh, the virus itself. But now, in a sense, instead of giving you the whole virus, we give you a little part of it, just some part of its genetic material, the mRNA, which in an ideal world does the same thing, gets inserted into your cells. You start expressing this protein, which then your body attacks and you develop an immune response to it. And we are amazingly lucky that... Um, that our scientists have been able to develop not one but two different vaccines. And we'll have many other vaccines using different modalities, I have no doubt, that come out in the next year or two. Uh, but the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines, we're very lucky that they exist and that they are apparently quite effective. But the, but the story is not over on those. I don't know if you want to talk about that, but, but it's good news. But I don't want people to get over optimistic either because, you know, it's my job to be a bit of a downer. Well, the this is the this is the unfortunate narrative that people keep saying. Uh, the the virus is killing. It's like the average immune system is ninety nine point whatever percent effective in protecting you from the virus. Meaning ninety nine point whatever percent of the people who get the virus survive. Whereas no, ninety nine percent of people overall survive. One percent will die of all people who are infected, approximately. And if you're older than 70 or 80, 20% will die. 
so why why is the number that people keep uh, talking about far less than that? Why is the, the the reported number of people that get the virus who actually wind up dying? It's it's not one percent. We're not we're not seeing one percent nationwide in terms of people getting the virus and dying. No, we know the answer to that question. Now, I don't think there's any ambiguity scientifically. So, so, um, it, so in order to in, in order to really compute these numbers, it's not easy. You're right. Um, we have to look at how many people. We have to have a way of ascertaining who's infected, and then we have to have a way of ascertaining of those how many die, and and uh, and that's called the infection fatality rate. And there was just a recent meta-analysis looking at very good data from around the world, multiple studies using different approaches that estimated that the infection fatality rate is between 0.5 and 0.8%. And there's something called the case fatality rate is the fraction of people who have symptoms who go, when infected who die. And that number is about twice that. So about half the people get the virus and have no symptoms at all. So if you get symptoms, you have a higher risk of death. And so you can double 0.5 to 0.8 becomes one to 1.6% of people who um, who develop symptoms from the disease die. And there was another very good study that was just released a couple of weeks ago that estimated the infection fatality rate to be about 1%. So there's a lot of little numbers I've thrown out at you. Right, but, but this but, is but people the gist with is, symptoms. Yeah, but even without symptoms, the infection fatality rate is certainly not less than half a percent and could be as high as 1%. I would say it's going to be in that range, the IFR, the infection fatality rate. Well, isn't there a large percentage of people that get it that don't have symptoms? Half, about half, we think. That's right. Okay. Of the people who get it don't have symptoms. But you said 99 point something percent of right. people who get it survive, and that point something is, is important. So I would say that if you said 99.5% of the people who get infected survive, I would say, yeah, it could be. But okay. it's somewhere in there. Well, I, don't think, I don't think I gave a number. I think I said 99 point something. But the yeah, point, okay. point being that, unfortunately, a lot of people saying this vaccine is 94% effective or 90% effective. Yeah, what that means on is who you that, ask. Yeah, yeah, but that what that means is, is that if you're uh, if it reduces your risk of death by that fraction. So, for example, in the vaccine trial, in the uh, Pfizer trial, uh, these numbers are approximate. Uh, in they, they had about 43,000 people in the trial. Half of them got the vaccine. Half of them did not. And in the people who got the vaccine, nine people, up to nine, let's say nine or ten, got, even though they were vaccinated, still got coronavirus. Still had the disease. The vaccine was not perfect. And in the people in the arm that did not get the vaccine. The vaccine, the other 20,000 people, let's say 90 people approximately got coronavirus. So what the vaccine did is, is it reduced your probability of getting the disease from 90 out of 20,000 people over the time window of the study to 10 out of 20,000 people. So the, the point here is, is that the, the, the vaccine is reducing your risk of getting seriously ill if you're infected. And, um, and it, it and and it's not, and you're certainly better off. In other words, you would have had, let's say, a one percent chance of dying uh, before, and now you have a 0.1 percent chance of dying, ninety percent lower than that, because we, you know, we've given you the vaccine. I Does that make sense? I, completely. I understand exactly what you're saying. What I'm trying to say is, there's an unfortunate narrative where people are saying, "I'm not going to take a vaccine because the human immune system is more effective than the vaccine." See, that's not true. That's what I wanted to get out of you. Yeah, so yeah, people yeah. People are That's saying, and, yeah. Go ahead. Well, no, I'm saying the vaccine. The whole way vaccines vaccines work is it it uh, enhances your your performance. You know, it's like uh, it, it it stimulates your immune system to make it even better at fighting the the virus. There's there's no sense in which you could argue that an unchallenged immune system is superior to a challenged immune system, a system that has been you know been given a vaccine. So. Um, this is what's important to tell people, right? Because this narrative of 99% of the people who get it, 99 point whatever, uh, your immune system is effective in fighting off this disease. Whereas with the virus, it's only 90 plus whatever percent effective in pre preventing the virus. So this is not a, this, that's not a good narrative, correct? That's right. And you, the way to think about it is just to pick some round numbers, as you were saying, and, and like 
and like uh, like me, you sometimes use the word virus when you mean vaccine, and you use the word vaccine when you mean yeah, virus. I'm so sorry. I, I do that all the time. Yeah. I do that all the time. It's so annoying. Yeah. But anyway, let's say for the sake of argument, you have an unvaccinated, you have a 99% chance of surviving if you get infected. Right. Uh, You have to add to that the benefit of the vaccine, which is a 90%, let's say, effectiveness. So it'll reduce your probability from 99% chance of surviving to 99.9% chance of surviving. Yes. Thank you. That's exactly what I wanted to get out of you. Um, Yes. There, there. That when when you talk about the people that took the vaccine, and uh, we know you you have the data between the difference of the vaccine, and the people that got the placebo, the people that got the vaccine that still wound up getting COVID, did they do health screens on these people and find out what comorbidity factors they may have had and see if there's anything that would indicate that there's per- per- particular risks. We don't know that yet. Those results haven't been released. And also what we don't know, so we don't know the answer to that, but we will know. And also what we don't know yet is we we don't know how safe the vaccine is. So first of all, just to be very clear, both Pfizer and Moderna have released interim results. And we have every reason to believe that the final efficacy results will be about the same. So as they complete the trial in the coming month or two and more people get sick in both arms, we don't expect suddenly the vaccine not to work. I mean, we've gotten to a point where it's, we're pretty sure that the vaccine will be effective. And, um, but we don't yet know the safety of the vaccine is one thing, we, another thing we don't know. And we also don't know something else. It's very important for people to understand, again, and since everyone needs to be an immunologist now, imagine that you're doing a trial and you're trying to see whether a vaccine works or not. You have to define what counts as works, what counts as an endpoint. So let me give you three possibilities. One possibility is we're going to measure, does the vaccine prevent you from even getting infected? Or does the vaccine say, you were not, or do we say, the vaccine is not going to be able to stop you from getting infected. The virus is going to take root in your body, but the vaccine is going to prevent the virus from making you seriously ill. Or do we say, actually, the outcome we really care about is death. Does the virus reduce your probability of death? So it's possible that the vaccine, for example, might just to illustrate this point, prevent you from getting seriously ill, but not reduce the probability of death. In other words, in the but in the Pfizer trial that I just described to you, with the in the in the vaccine arm, uh, ten people got sick, and in the non in the placebo arm, ninety people got sick. What if in both arms one person died? One out of the ten in the vaccine arm died, and one out of the ninety in the in the other arm died. We would say that the vaccine was effective at lowering your probability of getting ill, which is great, but it had no effect on dying. That's possible. It's possible that the vaccine will work at different uh, phases of the illness process. And so the Pfizer trial uh, revealed that there was a greatly reduced probability of people getting infected. The Moderna trial actually showed that its vaccine reduced the probability of people getting seriously ill, which is great but it might in fact have no effect on mortality still. We don't know. Furthermore, we also don't know whether this vaccine, even if it works, reduces, reduces, even if it works to reduce your probability of getting sick or dying, whether it works to reduce your ability to infect other people. Mm. So, so maybe we, we start vaccinating the population, we're reducing the individual recipient's probability of getting sick, but they still can spread the disease. So, so this is something else that's not known. So we don't know the safety, we don't know which outcomes are really being affected, and we don't know if it affects infectiousness. And all of these things are things we will soon learn in the coming year, but we don't yet know them. So I just, it's fantastic news that we have a vaccine, but I just don't want people to get, think it's a panacea. Episodes of the Joe Rogan Experience are now free on Spotify. That's right, they're free. From September 1st to December 1st, they're going to be available everywhere. But after December 1st, they will only be available on Spotify, but they will be free. That includes the video. The video will also be there. It'll also be free. That's all we're asking. Just go download Spotify. Much love. Bye-bye.